The American education system loves a good scary story, so it should be no surprise that one of the most taught authors in the States is the master of the macabre himself, Edgar Allan Poe. One of the most commonly taught Poe short stories, and the focus of this video, is The Cask of Amontillado. Oftentimes, textbooks will use this story to talk about plot, the ethics of revenge, and how to create suspense in the minds of the reader. The central action of Cask also shows up all throughout pop culture. All this is great, but there tends to be an over-biographical and definitely an over-Americanization of this short story that is very much set in the Italian Renaissance. Montresor opens his narration in The Cask of Amontillado by promising to not only punish, but punish with impunity. Bent on revenge, for some unspecified reason, he leads his unsuspecting enemy, Fortunato, out of a masquerade party and down into the Italian catacombs on the promise of proving Fortunato's sommelier level palate. Dressed like a fool and drunk on wine and compliments, Fortunato willingly descends into the insufferably damp vaults. Instead of the promised cask of Amontillado, he finds himself chained to an iron staple in the wall as Montressor begins to wall him in, entombing his enemy alive. Poe uses the original function of the catacombs to add to the terror. The crypt is lined with human remains, and the tools with which Montressor entombs his victim are concealed within a pile of bones, thrown down promiscuously upon the earth. Fortunato's terror is increased by his confrontation with not just his own death, but the physical remnants of death itself. While the cask of Amontillado might feel surreal to a modern audience, literary and historical records show that burying someone alive was a real part of Poe's world. Scholar David Cody describes Poe's creative process as imaginative alchemy. He was able to transmute a leaden mass of miscellaneous raw materials, appropriated without acknowledgement from other literary works, into the fairy gold that we encounter in tales such as The Cask of Amontillado. Cody goes on to list a number of potential stories with legitimate claims to Poe's source material for Cask. Ultimately, he zeroes in on what he calls a cruel tale of merry jest included in William Tome's Anecdotes and Traditions, illustrative of early English history and literature derived from MS sources. Wonder why that name didn't stick in popular imagination. Interestingly, for all his research, Cody's list of candidates shares little overlap with the work of an earlier Poe scholar tackling the same question. In 1932, Joseph Schick presented the Edgar Allan Poe Society with three potential sources for Cask. Like Cody, he also sees Balzac as a likely inspiration. However, Schick uniquely suggests that both Bulwer Linton's Last Days of Pompeii and Reverend Joel Tyler Headley's Letters from Italy could be sources for Poe. Of the three works, Schick argues Headley, whose work Poe wrote a scathing review of, is the most likely muse for Cask. Despite the thorough research of Poe scholars like Cody and Schick, a biographical legend of murder and burial, formed around Poe's time at Fort Independence, continues to circulate as the main source for Cask. The legend goes that when Poe was stationed at Fort Independence, he heard about a beloved lieutenant who was murdered by a fellow soldier. In an act of revenge, the dead lieutenant's friends got the murderous soldier drunk, chained him to a wall in an unused section of the fort, and built a brick wall to seal him inside. Besides showing up on a number of websites, this embellished part of history is published as fact in the 2007 McDougal Little 9th grade literature textbook for Illinois, which happens to be the one I used to teach 9th grade with. But in actuality, only some of this story is true, and the buried alive skeleton being found part, it's just apocryphal or at least it's taking two separate stories and fusing them together. Nonetheless, the wealth of potential inspiration for Poe's short story shows that this buried alive plot device is not the invention of a disturbed New England writer, but rather a deep-seated fear haunting the minds of the pre-modern medical world. And this is what I think we should really focus more attention on when we teach a story like Cask. After all, Sigmund Freud surmises that some would award the crown of the uncanny to the idea of being buried alive. This fear was so much on people's minds that Poe wrote about it on multiple occasions. 
there was an audience for these stories, and the fear of premature burial was so real that some took preemptive measures against a worst-case scenario. Before the advent of coroners and the widespread use of embalming, the death watchers, who were family and friends, had to use their best judgment to determine, sometimes by vote, when and if someone had actually died. One common method was to hold a mirror up to the individual's mouth and look for vapor. These techniques certainly leave a wide margin for error, and it was the rational suspicion that at least some people might very well be buried alive. While it was unlikely someone would be buried alive, it was certainly still a possibility. And like those today who have a fear of flying, favorable statistics don't necessarily eliminate crippling anxiety. It's little wonder then that 19th century America granted scores of patents for coffins with ventilation shafts, ladders, alarm bells, and even clockwork powered motion detectors. All of this is to say that even if Cask wasn't based on a Netflix film worthy true story, it's still worth talking about the true psychological inspiration for Poe's work. After all, like he did in so much of his writing, Poe saw the ghost haunting his society and made sure to tell its tale.